uh, Ricard Soler, uh, who is a speaker, invited speaker for, for this talk. Uh, Ricardo is a, a ICREA research professor at the UPF in Barcelona, head of the Complex System Laboratory of the Institute of Evolutionary Biology, you know, in, in, still in Barcelona, as well as external professor at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. And last but not least is a CRT fellows. That is, a, you know, is a, a connections with us. Uh, of course, Ricardo is well known uh, for his many, many contributions uh, to the field in general, uh, a complex system, you know, he's originally, is, uh, you know, is, uh, his PhD was originally physics, but then, uh, you know, he, he evolved uh, his, during his career, he moved uh, you know, from one topic to another, uh, touching upon many, many different uh, uh, fields uh, in, 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 uh, in biology as well. So he's, uh, you know, that's, he's a perfect speaker for, for this audience, I think. And uh, you know, his work has been recognized by several uh, grants. Uh, you know, let me mention just uh, the, uh, the, the ERC advanced grants that uh, you know, he was uh, awarded uh, some, some times ago and the James McDonald Award as well. So with that, uh, that said, uh, that said uh, you know, I, I'm really grateful to Ricardo for having uh, uh, accepted the invitations and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to your talk. So and, uh, the floor is yours. So let me just uh, tell to the, to, the, to the audience, please uh, uh, keep your microphone off during the talk so we don't uh, get disturbed by, by background noises. If you, are, if you are questions during the talk, which are, of course you are most welcome to have, uh, you know, please write in the chat and then uh, we will stop uh, that, you know, I will uh, let uh, the speaker uh, know that uh, you have a talk, you have, uh, you have questions. Thank you, thank you, Ricard, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks Akile for the kind invitation. And uh, I'm going to talk about something that is, uh, uh, we proposed a few years ago, and this, uh, it's, as you will see, a, a whole uh, research area. So I'm going to give you some, some uh, a glimpse of fundamental ideas about the possibility of building a theory for cognitive uh, complexity beyond the usual um, neural network perspective that we have on brains. And I'm trying to, going to define the things, see what interesting stuff is around, what is the evolutionary context, and what can... Okay, you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, should we start again? Okay. So I'm going to give a talk that uh, to some extent is about a research area that we proposed some years ago. And it's related to the idea of developing a theory, a theoretical framework to define cognition in a general broad perspective, connecting it with evolutionary dynamics, with uh, ongoing problems uh, today on um, artificial intelligence. And as you will see, it's, um, it's a domain, a field, if you want, where many open questions remain. And I'm going to try to summarize some of the interesting ideas around. Um, and this some, somehow starts some years ago at the Santa Fe Institute, when we co-organized a, a workshop with David Warper about what we call synthetic transitions. And this inspired with uh, this uh, groundbreaking work by Eorsha Smari and, and John Minor Smith on how to define um, the major innovations that uh, mark the evolution of life in our planet. In other words, although we used to think in evolutionary dynamics in terms of the Darwinian selection, um, Darwin's theory of evolution, despite it's clearly the first theory of uh, complexity in, the, in, in living systems, um, cannot explain uh, the big innovations that have happened through evolution. The origin of life, origins of cells, the origin of multicellularity, all the way up into uh, origins of language, for example, or consciousness. These are major innovation events that require specific theories. Um, we build this workshop with the following idea that you will see also uh, is within the talk. Uh, the idea that we cannot go back in time to kind of see what happened. Uh, we can infer a number of things using phylogenetics, compared anatomy, um, different strategies, but we can actually build evolutionary transitions in the lab. How is that? Well, we can use artificial life. We can use uh, synthetic biology, which is one of the uh, 
the uh, tools we have in my lab, we, we also have a, a wet lab, um, we can use things like evolutionary robotics. So actually evolve machines that can actually perform and learn to perform new functions. Or we can use statistical physics as a powerful framework to find out universal results, universal principles that we believe might pervade also the, the major transitions. And as in connection to that, a few years later, we organized another uh, workshop um, that we call liquid brains, solid brains, which has to do more uh, with this idea of how cognition emerges, right? As a consequence of the workshop, we edited this special issue in philosophical transactions, where uh, we tried to provide a kind of a first roadmap to this idea, right? How can we actually look at the major innovations using uh, not only what we see in evolution, but what we can actually build in the, in the lab or what can actually build from theories, right? Theories that uh, if successful can detect universal principles, right? Here you have several examples. As I was saying, um, we, look we look for a theory of cognition, right? And uh, this, this paper, a very, very nice paper, very, very recommendable by Eva Jablonka and, and Marion Lamb, provided a special, uh, powerful view of transitions related to cognition. How the first agents that can be called neural agents or cognitive agents emerge, right? That's a, an extremely important thing because once you have uh, cognition, then genetic information is not that relevant and Instead, what you can learn from the environment, what you can, the, the changes you can actually accumulate over your uh, lifespan become much more relevant. You have a new kind of information. All right, that raises uh, a lot of questions. Looking at, at cognition in terms of evolution, uh, you can ask many things, many things that are, most of these questions are pretty, pretty open, right? Um, for example, are different kinds of minds, different kinds of cognition. When, when what I'm saying is that not only thinking in human cognition and the alternatives, but also um, what kind of cognitions can we think about? Or what kind of cognitions can emerge in artificially evolved agents, right? How that happened in evolution? Um, what kind of preconditions are relevant there? For example, language, is a, a, probably a, an extremely important cognition for the emergence of the human mind, right? Along with other things. Um, it's a long list, okay? And one particular question is why brains, right? Why brains? And the, and the reason for that is quite generic. In, in fact, it's connected to a, a, a more general problem, which is the following. If um, being small and simple makes more much more easy to self-replicate why is the earth not just filled with bacteria why anything more complex than that okay and in particular why brains why masses uh, of neurons located in some particular part of a multicellular animal um, and we'll go for plants at some point right and one of the conjectures that is around is the moving hypothesis which essentially says that if I have to move in space, for example, because I have a heterogeneous distribution of resources that I have to find, moving around was pretty much uh, essential to push the trajectory that produces brains, right? So the moving hypothesis actually is connected with another very important principle is that we need brains because we need machines that predict the environment, right? Brains are machines that essentially reduce the uncertainty of the future. And that gives you an enormous advantage and that can explain why complexity can actually succeed in a world that is dominated by small replicators. In, in connection with evolution, I would like to highlight two important things. One is the role played by randomness and history, okay? To what extent given events right, uh, can change the future of evolution. And, and by that, I mean that um, Stephen Jay Gould here at, at, at uh, left said once that if we were able to go back in time uh, 500 million years ago to the Cambrian explosion and, and um, look, look forward to the type of evolution, what kind of biosphere we will see? And he suggested that um, a totally completely, completely different 
in biosphere, right? okay? That small differences from the initial conditions will propagate in such a way that the biosphere will be uh, something that we will not recognize and an alien world, right? Is that the case? Well, maybe not. And the reason why is not, and that's a very important question for complex systems, is that we see in evolution repeatedly that the same solutions are find, found again, again, again in totally different uh, independent pathways, right? Um, this book, Life Solution, sounds, sounds like self-help, but it's not. It's a book on, on uh, convergence, right? A book that in a way tries to compile ideas about how many times the same solutions have been found Okay, and the guy at, at Dried was a, a Catalan researcher, Sper Albert, who unfortunately died very young, who actually proposed this idea that there's a logic of life, even in particular logic of organisms that he called the logic of monsters that forbids many different solutions from happening, that there are very, very strong constraints suggesting then that if you go back in time and go back for, go forward with the type of evolution, you will see maybe a planet that will look different, but familiar. The same rules apply. Again, the, the eyes is probably one of the well best known examples. The eyes appear in particularly in vertebrates um, are uh, essentially the same kind of design, right? The, the, the camera eye, but you see them in octopuses, right? A, a completely independent invention and in other organisms, right? Like medusae, which is kind of crazy, you know, jellyfish with eyes. What I'm saying to eyes is eyes with a crystalline retina, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I'll tell you about another example that you will find out quite crazy. And for example, and that's, that's already in, within the, our cognition space that we want to explore, it's, um, it's quite amazing how uh, in cephalopods, right, octopuses, squids, we see that within the invertebrates, so a totally different trajectory, you see the emergence of a class of animals which have brains, as you probably have known, they are quite smart in a number of ways. And we actually look at the histology of their brains, you easily identify a brain structure with multi layers, et cetera, et cetera, right? Quite amazing. And again, supporting the idea that evolution does not invent things in, in totally completely different ways, but instead that there are constraints. One of the problems we face when trying to define uh, a general theory of cognition is properly defining things. And one of them is intelligence, right? If you look at the literature, there's an extensive literature that talks about intelligence, uh, particularly in, in animals, but also in robots, right? And we have intelligence or the, the label of intelligence in systems such as single cells. We'll, we'll talk about that. To plants, some kinds of animals, for example, birds, right? And the, the question of how to define intelligence is, uh, is far from being closed, right? You can have these general definitions, which are not bad, right? Intelligence is a collection of sophisticated cognitive, cognitive abilities, like problem solving, uh, social cognition, or planning, right? The future. Um, or you can have papers like this one, like, which I recommend is a very, very, uh, extensive review of ideas about intelligence, proposing also formal definitions, right? Like this one here, we're not going to discuss, but it's based on the idea of having a, an agent, like an organism, right? That moves in a given environment, you can actually compute the, the fitness of the environment and the number of environments, et cetera, et cetera. But definitions that are precise, of course, limit their applicability, all right? Well, that's the point I want to raise. To understand intelligence or cognition, if you want, we need to try to define the space of possibilities, right? And that's the other theme issue that came, came about uh, from our workshop at SFI um, on cognitive systems. You can see here a number, a collection of uh, systems that display cognition. When I'm saying that is that they display uh, potential for learning, for uh, decision-making, um, uh, they display memory, right? At some level, okay? And you have in the, in the upper part, neural systems in a, in a computer that is a neural computer. Um, systems that do not have neurons, like plants, for example. Systems that are neural, but uh, are liquid, 
And that's the big point. What I mean by liquid, I'll, I'll clarify that in a moment, right? But you can see agents move around, right? It's fluid in some sense. And the point here is the following. We do have a lot of, of theory and a long tradition in neuroscience, which has been a, a system science as ecology, for example, uh, in, through all its history. We have what we call solid brains, meaning what? Meaning that uh, once the development is complete, you have a set of cells uh, that uh, occupy a fixed position in space. And these cells are connected through a given uh, matrix you can consider different scales here. Um, but essentially, the matrix is topologically stable, except that the weights of the interactions will change over the lifetime of the organism in a way or another. What happens if instead of spatially located agents, I have agents that move around, around right? For example, this is a big picture of army ants. Here, individuals, which I know, they have a brain, but let's think in, in agents so far, move around, interact with others, but the interaction matrix is not stable, it's not fixed. What kind, our questions are, what kind of limitations do, the, do these impose on the cognitive potential of these liquid brains, right? And just to make a point, um, one, for, one example of this uh, is a, a termite nest, right? Termites um, are capable of creating these huge structures I, I put the example also, also to define complexity, right? Because it's something that we often mention that, uh, how do you define complexity? I want to give my definition. So they build these huge structures with meters of height, uh, with a very complex architecture that of course uh, allows the termite nest to survive under harsh conditions. And again, uh, cope with uncertainty in the environment, right? Uh, the, the picture on the right is uh, just a small piece of one of these nests in the, in the chambers where they have uh, the culture of fungi, so they have kind of agriculture. And if you look at the picture, it's a tiny uh, white spots. These are termites. Right? Why I'm mentioning this? Well, this is again a liquid system, although there's a scaffold here that they create and they, they interact with, right? And what do the termites know about how to do it? They do nothing. They don't understand anything. They don't have a mental map. They just, uh, they are blind. They interact with their nestmates. And it's from the collective intelligence, from the collective behavior that everything emerges, right? In other words, you can spend your whole life studying a single termites. You'll never understand how the complexity of the nest emerges. And that's my definition of complexity, right? I do talk about a complex system when I think in a system composed of many parts and that exhibits emergent behavior. So a behavior on one scale that cannot be reduced to the behavior of the agents at the lower scale. A lot of what we need to do is develop theory. And in the context of solid brains, if you want, um, we have a long tradition from the 50s, right? When, when uh, McCulloch and Pitts developed his first um, formal model of a neuron, you know, the, the, the basic units. Um, when John Hopfield, uh, developed his groundbreaking paper on, on, on how to model a network, extremely simple neural network capable of making associative learning, sorry, associative memory. And I put also Stuart Kaufman here because he also um, and the, in the late 60s proposed a model of genetic networks that in many ways it it's shares the tradition of cybernetics and where um, that was the, the starting point of a development of modern models that some of you know are based on threshold networks, which essentially means that you can, you can actually model genetic networks in a way that mathematically is not very different from the way we model neural networks. The idea, of course, is that I need to uh, make strong simplifications. Uh, so yeah, the idea is I transform the complexity of a neuron, which is a big one, into something that essentially is a unit that gathers signals from other neurons, right? That send inputs. These inputs can be positive or negative, depending on the nature of the connection. You integrate that and uh, within a threshold, you decide or not to send the information to other neurons, okay? All right, that picture, we are not going to go into the maths or anything, it's just to, to have the intuition. 
uh, that picture when you apply that into what's called the Hopfield model. The Hopfield model is a model where uh, essentially you have a set of neurons. They are zeros or ones, right? They are um, fully connected. Everyone connects with everyone. Uh, if I connect with you with some weight, you connect with me with the same weight, it's symmetric. So it's a number of simplifications that a neuroscientist will say, this is an oversimplification. But the beauty, the beauty of the model is that you can train the network, not with a program, it's not a program. It's, it's uh, something that is, uh, again, emerging behavior from the connectivity of the system. You can show that if you show, um, for example, images to, to the network, um, the network can learn them, right? Just by a simple rules of uh, waiting uh, and reinforcing or, or not connections. And in the end, with the dynamics of the network, you can have a system that when you show something that is incomplete, for example, a letter with some black and white uh, dots uh, change it, the network is capable of reconstructing the whole information. And that this is based on attractor dynamics. In other words, in a space that has high dimension, let's just have the intuition of that, there are valleys, right? The bottom of these valleys are the memories that have been stored in the system, right? There's totally emergent kind of behavior. So in, in, in this picture uh, on the bottom uh, right, I kind of give the idea that um, if you have these all these valleys, each one storing, for example, a silhouette, um, if I give you just half of it or some deteriorated um, uh, part of it, the network changes dynamically until it goes into the bottom where the whole information has been restored, right? So it has memory, and this memory is, we, we say, associative memory. OK, the other part of the story that I wanted to mention, because we need it, is that you can also look at uh, brains uh, or neural networks or solid brains, if you want, um, and the dynamical perspective. These are uh, uh, registers uh, from electroencephalograms of a patients that experiences what's called, um, um, it's, a, it's a kind of epileptic episode is called an absence and <coughs> excuse me and what we see here is that this is each um, time series is re a record from a different locations on the on the skull and it's, it's, it's an external measurement of uh, microvolts you see that you go from a regime we have uh, low amplitude fluctuations and then all of a sudden many places in the in the brain become uh, highly organized, quite, quite kind of periodic, right? So what kind of behavior displays the brain? Is it periodic? Or is it um, maybe random? The thing is that uh, none of them, that in fact, we, we know now that the brain exhibits a dynamical pattern that suggests that is what in physics we call uh, a phase transition point, right? Uh, in physics, you know phase transitions uh, and, tra and, and, and phase transitions, and meaning, for example, when a liquid uh, boils into, into steam or uh, freezes into, into ice, right? There are specific temperatures, right? Very well defined, that um, allow going from one phase where you have one kind of behavior to another phase, we have another kind of behavior. And it seems that for the brain, when you look at the propagation of activity, could be um, a very low propagation or a very high as in epileptic uh, events. And what happens is that the brain, the healthy brain, so to speak, it's in, a, in the middle. It's just in the, in the right, in the, in the critical transition from one behavior to the other. This is connected, oops, sorry, to uh, some piles or piles of rice, right? I'm just showing this video. You drop, uh, you hear you drop too many, but you hope you drop uh, grains of uh, rice in this case. You can see from time to time, there are big avalanches. And the idea is that this kind of phenomenon, which was um, postulated by, by a physicist, a Danish physicist called Perbach, um, quite uh, some years ago, uh, suggests the idea that you can spontaneously go into this critical state, right? where most of the time the system is has low activity, but sometimes has these avalanches of activity. And there's uh, some predictions from that, that say that if you look at how many times you see, for example, one grain falling or two of them or three 
um, it follows a very well-defined kind of laws, right? And it seems to happen on multiple scales in, in neural systems, right? Um, sometimes you have a piece of tissue in a Petri dish. Uh, sometimes you will see that one neuron gets active and goes inactive, right, spontaneously. And sometimes it, when it gets active, it makes someone else being active, right? It could be an avalanche of size two. And sometimes you have, you have these big events where a lot of neurons um, light up, right? If you look at the distribution, it follows some universal law, all right? So if we move, in, move into the liquid domain, what happened? How do we model that? Um, I have here just three examples of this, right? Would be the neurons define uh, a topologically stable lattice, right? Um, ants define uh, also a graph, right? You can actually look at uh, ants interacting with each other for, through antennae, for example. And you could say, okay, I interact with you and I make a link between you and someone else, but they move. So the graph is changing. And for the immune system on the right, you have cells, the immune system, as you probably know, it can also learn, it has memory, right? Um, as we know well, you know, vaccines and, and all, these, all these things and our responses to pathogens have to do a lot with that, right? It's a liquid system that is being evolved to actually respond to pathogens, okay? And in very peculiar ways. So it, you have cells that can in principle detect anything uh, alien that can, can come. And that's a, an astronomic number, right? But again, this is liquid, this is fluid. So what about cells? Um, can cells be compared in any way with brains or with uh, the kind of metaphor we use that to have a brain, you need to move? Well, uh, surprisingly, cells, you know, they are the, the really the smallest units in biology, the fundamental units. Uh, uh, most of the biosphere is single cell, of course. And when you look inside cells, cells have been compared with computers in a number of ways, right? Uh, the Dennis Bray's paper in Nature was kind of the one of the early proposals for that. Um, are they computers? Well, you, we know we can, they can sense signals, they can respond to those signals, they can process information, they can have memory, right? Um, and the thing is that when you look inside the cell, you see this terribly messy system, right? Molecules moving around is quite far away from anything called a standard computer, okay? And we do know they, they gather information. And for example, they can do something uh, thanks to networks of connections between receptors in the membranes and all kinds of signaling molecules inside the cells. We know they can respond. And for example, they can move going into the right direction to, uh, for example, find out uh, efficiently sources of food. So they can actually be considered cognitive machines that respond uh, to changes in the environment by actually adapting to that, making computations, right? And they move. So these are just three pictures of um, a macrophage with the M in the first picture and a, a drop of E. coli cells. Uh, macrophages are one example of cells in our immune system, but also in general in the immune system of most metazoans that uh, are capable of actually detecting uh, bacteria and actively moving in the right direction, even if the bacteria moves, they, they actually go behind it, right? So kind of a predators. And so the metaphor is not bad. You have a extremely simple mini brain there um, in a system that requires that because it moves in space. So kind of the moving hypothesis is there. What is the limit of that? Well, let's think about, you can actually formulate a neural network model for that. But the thing is that there are things in solid brains that you're not going to find out here. For example, in solid brains, it's easy to have interneurons, neurons that connect neurons, right? Which means that you can think in neurons or cells that detect things, sensors. You can think in cells that can actually execute some functionality, but interneurons are uh, an extremely important evolutionary event. Right, because that means that they will process information. They are not sensing external world. They are not uh, responding directly. They are actually processing information within the system. 
information processing can actually enrich enormously the behavior, right? And that also implies that if you don't have them, you cannot do a lot of things. Just an interesting uh, thing that um, I think is worth mentioning is that you could say, well, for example, they have no eyes, which, you know, eyes are very important. Sight was, was a major innovation in biology. But even that is not really true. There are some species or, um, or flagellates, so single cell organisms that have in, in the sea, that have been found, and that's not a metaphor, they have been found to have camera eyes. So inside these single cell organisms, because you know that single cells, eukaryotes, uh, cells with nuclei, they have all these kind of um, um, bacteria that have evolved uh, by symbiotic interactions. And what happened in this species is that but different kinds of bacteria organized in space, building a retina, uh, a crystalline, everything. I mean, you see the, the, the uh, electron microscope uh, section, this is an eye. Again, the same eye that we see in complex organisms, in a one, one cell organism. Another candidate for our list is Fisarum. We are still talking about cells. Fisarum is the largest cell that you can see with your naked eye. And actually not uh, at the microscope, not uh, just with a loop, just at the distance, right? In this Petri dish, we, you see, uh, believe it or not, it's a single cell, except that it's, it is multi-nucleated, has mul multiple nuclei. Fisarum is, uh, to make a long story short, is um, kind of a fungi that is able to actually branch in a very dynamical way, looking for uh, sources of nutrient, all right? Um, you can see it, if you're lucky, in the forest. They're very yellow, they can be really alien. The first time that was described in the United States, in a newspaper, they thought that it came to, from space, right? It doesn't, it's just, just from here. Um, a beautiful thing of Fisarum is that it can solve a lot of problems, meaning what? For example, imagine you have a labyrinth in the video there. Uh, you put, uh, you can actually see it with pieces of Fisarum that get together and connect in all over a labyrinth, uh, they like uh, cornflakes. So if you put a cornflake in the entrance and a cornflake in the exit of the labyrinth, uh, the, the pulsatile activity of Fisarum in a selection process that is not very different from what we call in physics, um, um, least action phenomenon, they actually find out the shortest path. So they solve, they solve the labyrinth. This is quite amazing and has been shown that it can solve a lot of problems that are kind of very standard problems in artificial intelligence or graph theory. But let's, let's be honest with that. Um, who defines the boundary conditions for the problem? Because you can see Fisarum, the computation of Fisarum and the cognition of Fisarum is based on its form. The final form, the final shape of the organism is the solution. Okay, so if you actually uh, from the external world. We put Fisarum in, in uh, a range of boundary conditions like a labyrinth or uh, whatever it is, right? We actually put the system in a way that exploits, not something that exploits in the field, but exploits a property that is very intrinsic, this, this um, least action behavior, right? So that means that this is extraordinary, an extraordinary organism, right? But we shouldn't try to think in it as kind of intelligent, right? The intelligence is limited in a number of ways. Just to mention that in ant colonies, we also see there's a long tradition for that. And we have in, in Europe, very important uh, pioneers in that, like, like Guy Um They, they also solve uh, problems using least action. Uh, for example, they can find out the shortest path between two uh, potential sources of food from the nest. And the kind of experiments that were done years ago uh, by Jean-Louis de Novour and, and others uh, reveal very clearly that what they do is, since they interact in this liquid way and information will be lost, this long range information, they use pheromones, pheromone fields, and in a way that they create pheromones, since pheromones dissipate, they dissipate um, more efficiently in the longer branch. So what is amplified is the pheromone in the shortest path. And there's a dialogue between ants and the pheromone field, right? Something also intrinsic and, and very fundamental in collective intelligence, right? Again, 
no interneurons. And there's a number of other features that are not there that we'll find in, in, in solid brains. Just to mention that we are trying to do that in our lab, uh, engineer uh, bacteria or mammalian cells. We, we are trying to do the same with the two possibilities to see if we can actually make these cells that will never try to solve that to actually solve the, the shortest path problem. So what happened with the attractor metaphor? This attractor metaphor that I just mentioned that uh, in a solid uh, brain model like Hopfield, you actually see that the solutions of the problem, which are essentially uh, correctly putting memories in, at the bottom of the valleys, the basins of attraction. Um, what, is the, what is the equivalent here? Is there any equivalence here? Well, one thing that you can do actually is, uh, and there are a number of very interesting models also for the immune network, um, thinking ants as very simple units, right? For example, imagine an ant that has three internal states. And with these three internal states, we define eight classes of, or eight tasks, okay? For example, um, ants, um, ants uh, um, in most cases are not uh, polymorphic. They, they just have the same shape, the same kind of organism. And the tasks that are executed are decided in a very dynamical way, okay? For example, harvested ants, they can, they can have uh, this kind of four basic states. Here you consider A because you consider the possibility of being inactive. We'll go for that in a moment. And essentially, to make the long story short, the idea is that you can make a model where essentially the ants interact as, kind of, as a kind of simple neurons and the decisions made have to do with the state of my neighbor, right? depending of with whom I interact, I have, I have a matrix that essentially decides if I'm going to shift and do some, some other tasks, right? But again, there's no fixed uh, matrix. So is there an attractor dynamics? It is, but the attractor dynamics and the attractors that you can define here, I def are defined in terms of the number of individuals executing each task, okay? So which you can actually see is that in a given environment with some particular constraints, the colony will evolve into a configuration, right? That is probably optimal for um, gathering the, the, the resources and protecting the colony, et cetera. But the, the bottom of the value here is the number of individuals in each task. By that, we say something really important. We, we don't have a, a matrix like the matrix in a solid brain. So we live in a much more reduced dimensional uh, world because we don't have this hyperdimensional uh, potential for uh, memories. We just reduce ourselves to a, a small quantity. Um, another example that I was involved years ago with uh, my mentor in UK, Brian Goodwin, involves another kind of puzzling behavior in ants, right? This is um, uh, a colony of ants, a species of, of ant that exhibits a very, uh, surprising behavior, right? Uh, I had one colony in my office and it was it's really remarkable. In these colonies, where you have, there are small colonies with maybe 50, 100 individuals. Um, they form um, an enclosure with sand, right? With some little holes from which you can know. So essentially you can have them in a flat, um, uh, in a flat place with uh, a glass to see them. Um, they behave in such a way that every 20 minutes, more or less, they, they have a peak of activity, right? Almost everyone is working. Working means that you clean the eggs, you take care of the larvae, et cetera, et cetera, right? But then the activity decreases and at some point, nobody is doing anything. And that happens for a while. Um, we try to explain that uh, building a simple, simple model where essentially the ants are either active or inactive. And we built a model that is pretty close to the model I was mentioned before about propagation of activity in a brain, right? Individuals move around. If I'm active, I move in the lattice. If I'm inactive, I remain in place. And with very simple rules of, of how things interact as a neural network, okay? It was possible to show that actually, provided that you have the right density of ants, we could actually reproduce exactly what happened in the columns. This, waves of propagation, right? But interestingly, they, they are not uh, totally regular, right? Actually, when we analyze this in detail, 
we found out that is uh, close to a critical state. So you have fluctuations uh, in power spectrum and all kinds of things you can measure that suggest that the colony self-organized itself into this critical state, right? Very interesting. Uh, one thing that uh, I just wanted to mention is that you might actually think, why is this useful at all? Why, why, why just not the ants more or less randomly activate and keep working? You can actually show, you can actually prove that that's not a good strategy. If you do that at random with the same average level of activity, um, you can guarantee that some items in the system will not be properly and carefully taken. Right? So maybe X will be uh, not clean or whatever it is. Instead, you have this synchronized activity, right? You will warranty that the computation that you have to perform, which is taking care of everything in the nest, right? Is going to be done. And because you're in the critical state, right? Most of the time, the activity is low, but you also warranty that it was gonna be large avalanches that will help to perform. Yes, just wanted to mention that we are trying also to do that with genetic engineering in the lab, making, making also our ants that exhibit this kind of behavior, right? Well, actually, there's another thing that we are we are trying to do. Well, we no, we are just did it. We just hope we will publish this soon, um, which has to do with uh, another kind of criticality that you see inside cells, right? Um, the idea that critical states might be important in in cells, uh, in particular, in uh, explaining. Uh, the way that cells differentiate in different cell types was um, was suggested by Stuart Kaufman also um, in that paper that I was mentioning and developed in, in, in much more powerful ways in the last uh, two decades. Uh, Roberto Serra and, and Marco Villani have been part of this story showing that uh, in terms of gene network regulation, if you uh, actually uh, perturb the system as if you want, as you perturb uh, a sand pile, you will see avalanches that actually follow a power law. There's another layer here that we have been pursuing in the last uh, uh, five years, right? Uh, we, we have done that both theoretically and experimentally. So the idea was, um, could we actually engineer within cells criticality, dynamical criticality, right? So that we create a state where the cell, uh, the cell itself, um, most of the time, has uh, small uh, activity triggers in from time to time uh, large peaks of activity. Uh, to make the long story short, uh, you can do that. You can take two genes um, that you, we engineer it specifically to act in a way as the external source of sand that you drop into the pile and a detector that detects when the pile is close to the the equivalent will be the angle of repose to the critical uh, domain, right? And this regulation between the two of them, uh, we show experimentally, it can be built within cells, that it actually confirms the idea that it is possible, right? This opens the door for a lot of potential applications and new questions. Uh, are these mechanisms being used within cells, uh, which could be a, a very powerful adaptive agent or not, and if not, why not? Other systems that are well known to exhibit this kind of uh, critical state are, for example, swarms. Swarms need uh, a whole a whole uh, lecture, but you have seen this in Rome. I've seen the most spectacular of them: these um, these uh, bird swarms that make all these shapes, and also the analysis, the statistical physics analysis of this shows that this kind of swarming behavior is very close again to criticality, which is, again, uh, let's think about that. If you are in the critical state, you respond very quickly. Uh, you're sensitive to, to perturbations, and so you can respond actual, in actual uh, optimality way to an external world. So I have you mentioned in the space of cognition, okay? I only have mentioned a few uh, examples, right? Because this, this is kind of a very ambitious uh, program. Uh, this is a potential space. In this space, I put, um, it, we call this a morpho space, it, which has a tradition in, in paleobiology and evolutionary biology. It's a qualitative space in this case, right? In one axis, I have, in the vertical axis, I have de developmental complexity. In other words, how relevant is the fact that it, it, there is a development that constructs an organism or a community? 
in the horizontal uh, axis is a liquid solid interplay, right? How liquid you are, how solid you are. And in the other axis is cognitive complexity. How complex is the kind of computations that you can perform? I put some, some examples here. For example, brain, of course, is in that uh, vertex, right? High cognitive complexity, um, of course, high developmental complexity and solid state. Um, organs uh, will be located somewhere. Remember, they are also solid uh, in the sense that cells maintain basically the same uh, location, or although there's turnover, right? And they perform some simple functionalities, so cognitive complexity is limited. Um, there's the space of the artificial, which is extremely active, uh, the, poten the potential for actually um, engineering or building artificial organs and organoids, right? Which also opens the door for new questions because some of them are uh, derived from stem cells that allow to build these micro brains, so called micro brains. Um, the immune system will be here, right? Liquid, uh, developmental complexity is very high, and cognitive complexity is high also. Um, and colonies will be in that corner, right? Uh, remember that, uh, look at this because it's located somewhere in between liquid and solid. And the reason for that is, as was mentioned before, the colony itself is liquid. It's a fluid network of agents moving around. But with very few exceptions, all these colonies have a scaffold, a nest, right? So the nest is a rigid structure. So the interplay of both is what actually uh, defines connection, uh, cognition. The microbiome, this is to a large extent kind of the, the dark matter of what we need to understand about biology, right? These huge uh, colonies that uh, inhabit ourselves, which makes uh, us think that the concept of a single species maybe is something you have to get rid of uh, because we are holobionts. We, we, we are a community of organisms and we know that the microbiome is uh, semi-fluid. It, it, it displays a spatial organization, at least in terms of gradients. It communicates with the immune system and it communicates with the brain, which means that we have several layers of unexplored cognitive complexity. Fisarum will be somewhere here, right? Um, and one beautiful thing that we have found out is that is the following. This is well known in, in, the, in the analysis of morphospaces from the beginning. When you build a morphospace, it can happen that uh, uh, a part of it is a void, is empty, is nothing there, right? is this uh, sphere that they put here, the unexplored morphology space. Um, when we look around, we don't find things there. But actually it inspired us because it doesn't, uh, sometimes you have this empty space because it's not possible to get there because you, you have strong uh, architectural constraints. It's just impossible maybe, right? In this case, there was no reason for that. And we thought that maybe with engineering, we can actually explore something that evolution has been unable to explore, right? And that seems to be the case, right? Recently, we have published this paper where we show that you can actually obtain uh, synthetic Turing patterns. And the way that was done is a mixture of inspiration from different systems, but one of them is social insects. The way that termites build their nests and interact with the structure that is growing, right? It's called stigma gene. So, um, what kind of open questions are there? Because uh, the fact that we tried to find out the space of cognition uh, generated totally new questions um, and some surprises, right? Um, I, I didn't mention a lot of examples that can be found there, right? In particular, there are things that uh, clearly points into a direction is that we need to expand theories, right? Um, there are uh, a lot of remodeling things that we see in some of these organisms. Um, some of them uh, are kind of surprising. For example, in metamorphosis, you know what a metamorphosis is, and that um, the caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. Both have brains. Interestingly, when you have metamorphosis, the whole system uh, disintegrates. So everything is reformed completely. So you have to go from one brain to another brain. Right, which seems kind of a big waste of energy. Planarias, which has, is in the middle here, is an extremely interesting kind of uh, organism. It's a flatworm, 
um, they have eyes, they have a simple nervous system, but it's, they have a brain. And look at this experiment I'm going to mention. You can train plant areas into uh, learning between two possible branches. Uh, for example, one leads to food, the other leads to something that is toxic. Um, you, you train a plant area until it uh, remembers, okay? So it knows how to get into the right place. Now you cut the plant area, the plant area in two. We know from a very long time that the two parts of the plant area regenerate the rest, right? So the part with the head regenerates the tail, and surprisingly, the part of the tail regenerates the brain, right? One will say that if I cut in two and I take the tail, since the, the brain regenerates from something that was brainless, the, the memory should be lost. But that's not the case. They remember, right? Another thing, um, I mentioned that we use models of ants or bees or whatever it is, making a strong simplifications. Like one enormous one is, I imagine that individuals can be described in terms of binary, uh, binary vectors, even zero and one, right? But of course they have brains. So what's the role of brains into that? Why models work well if individuals in principle are very complex? Not, not zeros and ones, right? And this goes into something that I think is one of the beautiful problems to, to solve within complexity. It's being called the complexity drain um, in the context of multicellularity. When you have a system where, because the system is capable of doing so many things, um, this can be done because the elements of the system lose complexity. Right? In ant colonies, we see that uh, quite well. Small ant colonies with a few ants, which exist, right? I, I saw them, for example, in the rainforest in Panama. They can actually see you from, from distance. Um, you see the individuals are pretty much independent to some extent. They, take this, they make decisions by themselves. When you go into a large colony, like the army ants, you have a, one million individuals, for example, moving through the rainforest like a single one. The ants are blind and they pretty much, again, respond to simple chemical cues. But the collective can do amazing things, right? Also, again, from learning and storing memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the individuals seem to be much less complex in terms of cognition, right? So there's no such a thing as, as in, this, in this drawing of an imaginary ant with a big brain, no such a thing as a really brainy ant. But what is the compromise? Uh, why the complexity drain and how can we make a theory of that? What about plants? Because there's a lot of literature on that. Um, a bit controversial one, right? Plants are amazing, right? Uh, plants are amazing uh, creatures. They have been adapting in multiple ways. They have... Um, colonized by sorry. Below ground fungi Let me, because the fungi Let me skip this. Um, they have adapted in multiple ways. They have if actually change the, the, the planet completely. Um, and they actually have beautiful strategies to cope with many things, right? For example, um, if I have to, to deliver my seeds, uh, but the seedlings can be uh, predated by a, a very efficient predator, um, how, do I avoid, how can I avoid this? And some plant species use chaotic synchronization. So it's called masting. They actually synchronize the seedlings but they do that with a dynamical state that is chaotic. So it's not periodic. So there's no way that a, a predator that can eat the seeds can actually go uh, kind of coordinated as a simple couple of oscillator into that. They can have some learning, they can have some uh, sensing, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, plants are organisms that live by using an energy source, right? They are, they are autotrophs, they just use the light, okay? So they don't have to search. Remember the moving hypothesis, you don't have to move around. Do they need a brain or do they have structures that we can actually call brains? This is here, it's just, it's, it's ongoing research uh, that I'm doing with my, my colleague, Salvador and Nebreda. We made a model uh, that then just give you the idea in a nutshell that we evolved artificial life system, right? We evolve a population of agents 
that move in a lattice, right? And at the beginning, the agents can exploit two kinds of resources. One is the equivalent of light, is some energy that is always there you can use. Um, I mean, growing, etc., in moving, it has a cost. And then there's a other kind of resource that is around, right? But if you want to exploit it, it's better that you are able to detect it because otherwise it's random, right? So if you evolve that in an artificial life system, what happened under very general conditions is that there's a breaking of this original symmetry and, and the evolution of what you can call plants, which lose completely uh, the potential for detecting anything with just non-cognitive agents and animals, right, that evolve a mecha mechanisms or above the capacity for detecting the surroundings and searching for the right place with the highest population, with the highest uh, resource, right? One point to make here that I think is interesting is that the only part of plants that is moving are the seeds, right? And it's really interesting to see that actually the seeds are to some extent a kind of a simple kind of cognitive agent. They do have genetic circuits that can make decisions, right, under the right conditions. For example, when to germinate, right? This is the moving place, and the moving place has some cognition there. Um, almost finished. So cognition can be found in many ways, in many instances. I just uh, tried to give you a small picture of some of the, of the universe that is there, cognition, cognition uh, in terms of um, making decisions that are informed by the environment and, and making the, those decisions uh, be a source of adaptability. And again, especially uh, a way of reducing, if you think in information theory, reducing the uncertainty of the environment, right? They all share this kind of potential, but because each of them has different uh, ecological constraints or um, functionality constraints, for example, uh, in the immune system, I just my main function is detecting uh, pathogens or well, invaders from the external world, and I have evolved for that. Do I need anything else? Do I need kind of interneural interneuron structures? Maybe not. Um, and I think that this is why uh, developing a theory can be actually one way of looking at the evolution of cognition in a in a kind of refreshing way. This is a paper I also wanted to, to recommend uh, by John Hoffield. It's not, not very well known, but I think it's very interesting where it actually, actually defends the point that when you want to make a distinction between biology and physics, one uh, apparently very, very strong point to make is that biology, the biological systems perform computations, right? They actually interact with the external world in adaptive ways, in ways that you can actually define as computations. And that's some of the people that's been working with me over the years on some of these topics. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. This was really a very fascinating journey in the, in the, in the realm of, of complexities. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are many questions uh, given the, uh, the audience. So please uh, use the raise hand facility to, to ask the questions. Okay, let me see if I can. Maybe I, maybe I can get, I can start with the, you know, because one of the, the things that I always, you know, I was always wondering is uh, most of these uh, these models they are set cellular automata model that, the, and, and but uh, you know in this uh, so they don't uh, they don't embed the stochasticity whereas uh, you know I w I'm expecting that some of these uh, you know system uh, are clearly stochastic so stochasticity should be part of it so you know. Can, can you comment on this? Yeah, sure. For example, in when you when the example I discussed about this this ant colony is that is exhibit fluctuations, yes. right? Uh, these kind of semi-synchronized fluctuations. Um, of course, the the simplest model we can make that is mathematical and deterministic is a kind of an epidemic spreading model, right? Which is not bad. Uh, again, as usual, the model. The decision of what model to choose depends on the question. So it's just, we just want to actually see that there are two potential phases, right? That's something that is fine. But of course, as soon as you want to uh, uh, understand the, the adaptive nature of that, for example, that the ants um, actually evolve 
dynamically into this critical state, you need to go into something more. Uh, you have to incorporate stochasticity because the activation thresholds, the way it propagates and, and how noisy is that is relevant. And if you go to go more you're beyond that, uh, for example, you want to understand how the nest is actually uh, reshaped. Uh, because for example, in this case, imagine you have a colony uh, with a circle of sand and you, you take the sand and you push it to the center, right? So you automatically increase the density of ants inside. What you will observe is two things. One is that the ants are more active, which is, which is what the theory predicts, right? And has been validated. More ants in, in packed in less space, they, they synchronize more easily. But at the same time, and you have to put that behavior in the model, they start to push the, the grains of sand in a totally distributed way until what? Until the, the critical density is achieved again, right? So you see a system that self-organize into that state. And of course, every single thing that you want to understand requires to make models more complex. And in particular, of course, have stochasticity there because otherwise you don't have distributions, for example. Yes, okay, thank you. Excellent. I see that Maria has a, has a question, please, Maria. If you don't find that the, 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 the raised end facilities in the reactions, uh, you know, uh, then you, it's, it's inside there. And if you don't find it, just unmute, unmute your microphone and ask the questions. Please, Maria. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your fascinating lecture. Really enjoyed this, uh, these topics and uh, all these new ideas uh, I did not know about. So just as a matter of curiosity, so, um, in the past, there was a quest for some kind of archetypes of morphology of plants and animals. So in particular, I'm thinking of Richard Hohen with the archetype of vertebrate animals and Goethe uh, with the archetype of plants. So I'm warning, starting from this research on like embodied cognition through um, different types of living beings and not only. So I'm wondering if we can ask like uh, the new version of this question with researching some kind of um, intelligence archetype. So it was so very really interesting to, to see like the uh, morphospace of embodied cognition. So just wondering if some similarities or like looking for similarities in patterns of communications between living beings and the environment can help us um, like contextualize and maybe answer this question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can, I can, I mean, my answer is a positive and negative. The positive is absolutely agree. I, I believe that in our search for this understanding the cognition space and whether or not we have classes of cognition, um, mm -hmm. we'll find out the equivalent of what you call the archetypes, which could be universality classes, whatever we call it in the end. But I'm pretty convinced that, for example, once you go into uh, the stable matrix of connections into something that is, is, is liquid, automatically you go into a, a, a new set of possibilities, which is played in, in, inside by other classes, which they will depend, I think, in the context, the context that you have to, to leave how, why you have to replicate, why you have to do the functionality you do, whether or not you are inside an organism, for example, like the immune system, which is, you know, a peculiar situation or the microbiome. So I'm sure about that. The, the, the negative part is that that's our research. I mean, we have to actually find out um, how can properly define the classes, um, because as usual, when you, you decide to make a, a simplification to define a modeling approach, you always you know, have, have this in, intrinsic doubt. I mean, am I living outside something? Um, we'll see, we'll see. But I'm pretty sure it's been, uh, it's been a few years since we started this. Uh, this came, actually wanted to mention, this came from a brainstorming at Santa Fe. We were in, around the table and I had this crazy idea about, uh, can we talk about something like liquid brains? And from that, everything started to, to go ahead. Um, in a few years, I think that we start to have a picture of some of these things, right? Uh, like, for example, um, whether the, the degree of connectivity can be analyzed in some continuum way, 
guys, if I'm more connected, because I could also think in imaginary systems, systems that they are not liquid, they are not solid, maybe kind of a matrix of connections that is in the middle. We don't seem to observe that in nature. So why is that? Because probably because there's a basic principle, because you either have this uh, matrix of connectivity or you are liquid, right? But discover the principles is one of the challenges here. Thank you. Thanks. Matthias, is a question? Please, yes, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you so much for a very fascinating presentation. That was, that was truly very interesting to me. Um, and I guess my question would be very similar to the one that was just uh, asked before. Um, towards the end of the presentation, you um, sort of sketched out that abstract space and mentioned that evolution um, didn't really go into, into one particular spot um, of, of that space. Um, and I guess my question would be, why would that be? Um, at first, I thought this would be sort of similar to the vertebrate land invasion um, and that it would just not have happened yet. But then again, I mean, the land um, that was that was invaded um, at that time is, is a very physical space. So I guess it's it's not it's not really the same, is it? So I was wondering, you know, why why that why that could be? Whether you have an idea on that? Mm. I'm not sure I know exactly. I mean, I know the example of, of the, the invasion of land, uh, but you're referring to this this void, is the empty space in the in the morpho space. Maybe you're mute now. <laughs> I can I can hear you. Yes, I, I actually um something was ringing here and I, I didn't understand the question you asked. I'm sorry. Could you repeat your question? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, yes, you were referring to the invasion of land as yes. Kind of a, a metaphor, but you, you were asking about the the empty part of the morpho space. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, I mean, it's it's difficult to conjecture why this big chunk of the morpho space is empty. As I was saying, um, one interesting thing which makes the area also novel in in that respect is that as our part of synthetic biologists allows to actually thinking possibilities there. Um, in some other cases, that's not the first morpho space we have constructed. We have been constructing the morpho space, for example, for computation in cells. And there, it's very interesting to see, for example, that, to give you another example, that um, you also see a void in the system. And one thing that we have learned from trying to do experiments, it's, it's, a, it's a hard lesson for a theoretician, is that sometimes you drew, you drew a diagram of genes interacting in this particular way. For example, when we try to make a cell chaotic, right? To, to show chaotic fluctuations. And what happened again and again and again that the circuits uh, promoted a response that was to the cell to kill itself, right? Because you know, inside cell, you have a whole machinery that decides that if something looks wrong, I kill myself, which is, an important innovation, believe it or not, the program cell death. Important for us, for example, as metazones, right? If we didn't have these kind of mechanisms, cancer would be much more common. So that allows you to understand why something in the space has not been selected. For the space that you were showing, the void is quite big. And it can be the case that we are not properly identifying something. And I have in mind the following, for example, we think in the microbiome, as a kind of a, a complex ecosystem, right? Which we know that interacts with the immune system. But, we, but maybe it's wrong to separate the network of interactions between microbes and the network that connects them with the immune system. Maybe this is an entity. If that was the case, then that would be something that is in the void, okay? But we don't know. We need to, we need to do a lot of research on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Gregor, uh, nice to see you. Uh, Hi. You ask your questions, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a question. It's a little uh, meta question, perhaps. Uh, you know, you cover a lot of different fields, essentially, different areas. And um, I, I know some of your papers I, I, here in the talk, you covered uh, some. And, uh, and I, I would say you're looking for certain principles that are perhaps common or, you know, manifest themselves in different fields. I'm very sympathetic to that. That's something I, in my own career, I've 
essentially done sometimes, but I wonder there is also some kind of tension in that it does frame the view of these different fields mm -hmm. in a particular way. And in some cases, uh, you know, that might actually be a distortion for, for that particular field. And so for instance, you were, just to make it concrete one example, you, you were talking about uh, this multi-attractor picture of memory. And that's a metaphor that's been used quite a lot and is still influential. Um, but it actually, I think, has, has also had some negative effect. It's, for instance, um, you know, when you actually really think uh, or work with the psychologist on processes of, of memory, you uh, see that there are, uh, it's essentially defined through processes of recall and, and how, you know, acute recall, and how that actually works. And you see that that metaphor actually doesn't really speak very well to these questions. It is more sort of a descriptive uh, meta level. But uh, for instance, what, what, you know, what happens when you don't remember something? Where, where is it? Just, which attractor does it sit there? You, know, where, there's, you can see there's some conceptual flaw a little bit in that picture. And, and so uh, in other cases, I don't understand these systems well enough to know, but I wonder, what's your position relative to that? Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think that is very important. And I think I, after 30 years of work, I, I learned, learned the lesson that you have to be careful in, in not, um, not believing too much into simple models in the following sense. I'm not saying that they are not good, they are good. And I think the, the right point is, uh, we know the limitations and what is the right model? Uh, and I give you an example that I, I, I teach to my students, um, just to move out from the cognition part. Um, we know that viruses infecting bacteria can be into states. In one state, they grow inside bacteria until they destroy it and just burst. In another state, they integrate within the genome and they remain silent there, right? And you can switch from one to the other. How do, you how do you explain that? And there's an extremely, extremely simple model, which is a Boolean little thing that you can explain in, in, in three minutes that explains that. Explains the question, answers the question of why there's a cycle with two states that are alternative. So the model is an extreme simplification. It's almost ridiculous, but, but it's the model that explains that question, right? It answers properly the question. Now, if you want to move into something more, like how the, this switch evolved, how noise has an effect on that, then that model is useless, right? It has answered the question at that particular level, right? Which is perfectly fine. And the logic of that, of that model remains in the system, but you have to add more complexity. The, the point you made in terms of, of psychology and that's that about neuropsychology is really good because the attractor picture, I do think it provides uh, a neat way of, in a, in a fundamental way of understanding that associative memory is not a mysterious thing that emerges with some very complex kind of phenomenon. I think that this essentially captures associative memory, but of course, gets very, very limited. And that's why I put also the, the example of the fluctuations in brain activity. In Hopfield's model, you, you go into an attractor and remain there forever and you don't do anything else. Um, where are the sensors from the external world? Where are the interactions between different parts of the brain? Nothing of that is there, right? Um, nevertheless, I, I do think that it's possible. I've been searching for that since I started to, to work on that. Uh, there have to be general principles of organization of complexity. Um, but we need to find out the, the right language and, and the right theories. And that's not an easy task. There is another question from Ramon. Please, Ramon. Yes, my, uh, thank you for your talk. And I was really, I really like this idea of like solid and liquid comparison. And uh, in the case of the brain, uh, I was thinking that in particular, you were talking about the brain when it's already developed mm -hmm. and consider it as a solid uh, network. But what happened during development, during embryogenesis, in that case, you would consider that it's actually more like liquid. It's just a question of time scales because something that might look solid in one scale is actually liquid in another scale. So like, if you have any comments on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, when, when you have 
you have development, you are you are you don't have the final agent. You have an agent that is being developing, and and we know that not only from the the, ter the terms of architecture, that um, I will say that again, this is as you can see, uh, you you said it yourself that it is not liquid nor solid. It's I get cues from from the context, and from that I move within the system to to build new structures and, and connect. Um, but across across the, the development, many things happen from, from total restructurations, some transitions clearly in terms of cognition. Language acquisition will be an example that, that we also analyzed years ago. There's a, it's a dramatic connectivity and a cognition phase transition about two years. Um, but if you want to do the, the theory of cognitive systems, I think that we already have a, a lot of work to do, assuming that the agents are kind of mature and that they, they have all the potential there, right? But you're, you're right. And actually this, can, this question reemerges in, in most of my talks about this. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I don't see any additional uh, hands. Of course, we hope that some of these questions that you know they, 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 they come up with during these talks may steer further collaborations. That's our job. It's, it's, it's like to act in a, as a hub to promote collaborations. So maybe we were planning to have a follow-up discussion on, on, uh, on funding, but unfortunately, this is not possible uh, this time. We will do uh, next time, you know, uh, you know, specifically for for the for, for these topics. So please, uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, you know, check in the web page because uh, there will be a lineup of uh, of talks uh, that they are coming up. And until that time, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, stay well and stay healthy. And uh, and I see you next time. So let me take uh, again uh, Ricardo for this beautiful talk. So this is a virtual clapping from uh, from the whole audience. And uh, and uh, see you next time. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.